Rub up your engines! Where's some more great quality control news from Stellantis and Chrysler? Guess what? Stellantis is recalling 285,000 sedans because the side curtain airbag inflators could break open throwing metal shards into your head. That quality control at that company, I mean, it was bad enough when it was Chrysler. Fiat bought it, it got even worse. Stellantis bought them, and now it's even worse than it was. It's just unbelievable. What, it's like you're flying over Germany Germany in World War II, and the Germans are shooting flak at you, right? So metal fragments try to hit you. Well, in this case, it's your own vehicle. They had to recall 285,000 Dodge Charger and Chrysler 300 sedans in the United States alone, because the side airbag inflators might explode and put metal shrapnel into your head. Who really designed these things? It turns out that now they say, well, they may not have built them right, so when they built them, moisture may have gotten into the inside inflators, so they then they can crack and metal shards hit you when they go off. Kind of like they've turned the inflators into popcorn. That's how popcorn works. There's moisture in the kernel. The heat gets it and turns the steam pow, and it makes popcorn, right? Well, in this case, your side airbag in these cars might turn you into popcorn. Now, as per usual, they're not going to tell you from Chrysler for a while. They always take their time. And this is the side bag curtains on both sides, right? So in the meantime, maybe wear a football helmet if you're driving yours around or don't drive it at all. Of course, you wouldn't be in this pickle if you listen to me, because I tell you don't buy these Dodge products. They're crap anyways. <laughs> now you know they are. Now here's a hilarious one, right? Ram decided, oh, we're not going to have our Hemi V8s anymore. We're going to put in our straight six-cylinder engines. They call it the Hurricane Inline Six. And much like a hurricane, it uses lots of energy. It turns out that it gets about the same gas mileage as the gas hog Hemi that it's replacing. Check it out. According to the EPA ratings, the high output Hurricane six cylinder engine delivers 15 miles a gallon city, 21 highway, and 17 combined. The V8 Hemi managed 18 in the city which is better than the 15 the Hurricane gets, 22 on the highway that's better, and 19 average. So it actually gets better gas mileage than this straight six. Do they have engineers at Stellantis, right? Do they? Did they actually test this crap out? Or, well, it's a six, the other's an eight, of course it's going to get better gas mileage. It's actually getting worse, and that's the rating. Wait till you start towing stuff. If you tow stuff with a V8, you're going to get better gas mileage than towing something with a six-cylinder engine. Do they have real engineers? Engineers at Stellantis, or are they just a bunch of clowns taking a ride on the bus to nowhere? <laughs> There's a reason I call Fiat, Chrysler, and Peugeot, which make up Stellantis, the three stooges of car manufacturing. Okay, here's some real life electric car news. Guy says, I tried charging a Ford F-150 Lightning at a Tesla supercharger. It didn't go as planned. You know, Ford gave them the free adapters. Adapters don't cost that much anyway. Big deal. You buy a car for hundred grand, they give you some plastic piece of crap adapter for you, right? So they can use them at Tesla stations. Well, it didn't work out too well. He looked on his screen and showed him the nearest Tesla supercharger. Then he says, once I arrived, it was already crowded with Teslas taking up all the parking spots. I had to juggle trying to park in the narrow lanes. Then I got in and the plug wouldn't reach. I carefully got out of it without hitting a nearby Tesla when I did squeeze in, and it wouldn't plug in. But I got lucky. The move parked diagonally over two parking spaces so it would reach me. But then it was still short, so I gave up and went to another Tesla supercharging station. Now, before I plugged it in the Tesla at a charge level of 71%, and after 28 minutes, it got me to 89. So that's what? 18% charge in 28 minutes. Yeah, that's not fast, right? At that rate, it would have taken me 2.6 hours to get a complete charge. When they talk fast charging, it's hypothetical horse manure. Then you get these things and find out what a headache it is, if you can even get them plugged in to actually charge them. They rate them at all kinds of stuff, but in reality, they don't put out the max hardly ever, right? I had a guy bring me a Lightning EV when I was in Rhode Island. He almost didn't make it. He said, Scotty, I got halfway there and there were eight guys in front of me. Luckily, I found another one was able to charge it, get to your house. And he said, hey, this is it for this thing. He said, this is the first trip I've taken. And he said, when my lease is up, I'm getting rid of it. He said, it's fine driving in town and stuff where I can charge it. But on trips, he says, it's unbelievable. And those have such a huge battery. Even at a supercharger, it's going to take him 2.6 hours for a full charge. Say he wants to drive five, 600 miles one day, which is what people do all the time when they're doing long trips. That means he's going to spend probably five hours charging. So that would make his trip 
last, you know, three quarters of a day instead of half a day. Yeah, it's just kind of ridiculous, the whole thing. Okay, I read this article. GM's current four-cylinder engines are just as powerful as 2001 V8s. And then the guy shows, in 2001, a Chevy Silverado V8 cranked out 238 horsepower, but now their four-cylinder turbo puts out 233 horsepower. The four-cylinders are, are almost as powerful as the V8s were 23 years ago, right? That may be true on paper, but when you buy a vehicle, what do you want? Long life. Now, I'm not a fan of GM, but back in 01, they made decent V8 engine pickup trucks. I have customers that still own them. Some of them have 240,000 miles. The engines are still going. Now, generally, most of them, the tranny crapped out, and they had to replace the tranny once or twice on that 238,000 miles, right? But the engines are still going strong. We're talking about engines here, right? I have seen these four-cylinder GM engines that they're putting in them now blow up as early as 55,000 miles. You are never going to get the mileage out of one of these things that you do out of the old ones. Turbo fours are never going to last as long as a normally aspirated V8 engine. Of course, the manufacturers love it because then when the engine goes, they either sell you an expensive engine or they sell you another vehicle, right? They love planned obsolescence. We're trying to save money these days, get things that last longer. They want to sell us crap that, yes, it's fast, but it won't last. I break things, says. I got scammed. I bought an 07 Honda Odyssey with 130,000 miles. It looks clean, drives great, but the VIN on my scanner says it's an 05 Honda Odyssey, but the VINs on the dash doors and trunk say it's an 07 Honda Odyssey. What should I do? Should I leave it alone? Okay, well, you may not have gotten scammed. I can never see anybody going that far. If the VIN on your dash, that's the dash, right, and on the doors and on the trunk say it's an 07 Honda Odyssey, but the computer says it's an 05, only thing I can figure out is nobody's going to go to the trouble getting an 05, putting different doors on it, and the dash assembly. So probably what happened was your car broke before you had it, and they replaced the computer with the computer. An 05 on Odyssey instead of an 07. And since it runs okay, I just live with it because I can't see anybody going through all the trouble of changing the body, the doors, the trunk, all that, unless it had been in a massive wreck and they replaced those parts. And if it was in that much of a wreck, you're not going to say it drives and runs okay. The doors wouldn't close, right? So I'm assuming somebody just had the computer replaced and they replaced it with one that was for an older one, but they could reprogram it. And if they reprogrammed it right, since you say it runs fine, I wouldn't even worry about it. I just live with it, right? Because I can't see anybody trying to pull a scam where they changed all those parts just to make it look like a newer car. I have never, ever seen that happen. Oh, here's another good laugher I got. This is from the Oxford Mail in England. They tested a train, and it's an electric locomotive, right? The locomotive went 86 miles on Wednesday with speeds up to 60 miles an hour on a hilly route with elevation changes of up to 600 feet. There's a big problem with this. It wasn't pulling up a load, right? Right? <laughs> Trains are made for one thing, to pull a heavy load. I'll give you a perfect analogy that most people are going to easily understand. The Ford Lightning electric pickup truck, right? They said it's got a range of 250 miles, whatever, right? When it's towing, it's maximum towing. They'll go maybe. 80 miles. So if this train went 87 miles, trains are not just for, oh, I'm riding around in a train. No, they're made to pull heavy loads. They're not going to be going all 86 miles pulling a heavy load. There's one in Australia that's a helper electric, battery electric locomotive, but it's hooked up to a regular diesel. And the only reason it even works is because it's in a mine in Australia. And from the mine loaded with all the rock ore going 200 something miles to where they're going to refine it, right? It's all downhill. So when it's going downhill, all that ore is going downhill and it uses kinetic energy to regenerate power to the helper locomotive right? It's still running in a regular locomotive. But then when it goes back up, it goes back up empty. Then the helper locomotive helps it go up. Now, the guy said, well, we couldn't pull the train with the helper locomotive even empty. Or we'd only get five, 10 miles or something because they're not made for pulling heavy loads. Battery electric vehicles, right? Diesel trains are electric, but they have a big diesel motor that generates electricity in a generator. The wheels are the motor, and then it's an electric motor turns the wheels, right? You're using diesel to generate electricity. If you had batteries in one of those things, and you could, they're already electric, you could 
change the diesel motor for batteries, and you'd probably get, you know, five, 10 miles on a load, and you'd be out of power. They're trying to force the stuff in, showing that, oh, it's going to work, it's going to work, it's going to work. No, it's at such an early stage, and the thing is, they lie about it so much. It went 86 miles, but without a load. The only thing that means anything for a locomotive is to be pulling a heavy load, because that's what they're made for. And if you're talking about them running without a load, there's no point in even talking about it. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.